Do you know your risk posture? With Crossbow, you can run and analyze adversarial campaigns in real time against your production infrastructure to validate your intrusion detection, antivirus, phishing protection, and incident response. Know your cyber exposure with Crossbow. Hey, we're here, and we're with Don Pizet from IT Pro TV, which he came all the way out here so that we could meet up together, and usually he's on via Skype, and sometimes we're <laughs> at his place. We just see each other all over, dude. It's awesome. It's Why awesome. would East Coast people meet on the East, East Coast? Coast? That's crazy talk. <laughs> Come out to the <laughs> desert and let's meet. We live literally from the top to the bottom of the East Coast. It's uh, We've got Providence, Rhode Island, we've got uh, Delaware, and we've got Florida, but we're all in Vegas together. Yes, and we're going to do some trivia. Sure. Have you have you ever done? You've never done trivia with us, have you? Uh, we did the unofficial off-air hacker movie, movie trivia, trivia, which I thought I would do terrible at. I, I, I pulled it off decent. Yeah. So now you're confident, um, and now we're going to destroy <laughs> your confidence by asking you either: Do you want to do malware trivia or famous hackers? Uh, famous hackers for five hundred. <laughs> I don't know that many famous hackers. The most of them. The malware trivia is pretty. Trivia. Hey now, pretty. you're skewing my. I know. Let's, let's go malware. I malware know. trivia for three hundred. <laughs> oh well, you got my back. We can go. We can go famous hackers. I can't. I've actually heard the questions. All right. And all right, the, well, more importantly, the answers. <laughs> uh, let's let's go malware. All let's right. Let's up. do it. The Morris Worm was created by Robert T. Morris and spread rapidly throughout the world, becoming the first worm to spread extensively via the internet. In what year? Oh, I gotta remember a year on that. Gee, I'll that give you a couple of choices. Ready? 1982, 1985, 1986, or 1988? I'm gonna go 1986. It was 88. Close, uh, close. Yeah. Um, Robert Morris was tried and convicted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. One of the first, actually, to be convicted under that law. What university was Robert Morris at when this occurred? Um, I have no idea. I'll go. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, no. So this is a challenge. Uh, MIT, Cornell, or Harvard? I was gonna say MIT, so we'll, we'll go with that one. That's the most popular answer. It's wrong. It's actually Cornell. I That's why I threw it in there. MIT? It's like a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> he went to MIT afterwards. That's why. Yeah, and his dad, or his dad, or he was the the dad. He went to MIT. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Michelangelo virus was first discovered on February 4th, 1991. It, of course, ha was the uh, on a certain day of every year, it would activate and destroy your BIOS. What day does the Michelangelo virus activate? Uh, shoot, you know, it's... Uh, no, well, hold on. I'll so give you a hint one. first. It's the birthday of Renaissance artist Michelangelo. Which I know they haven't proven. So there was some debate <laughs> over that, like whether the birthday was real. And I, I got, Maybe he does know the answer. I know. Uh, I've got... Well, it's, there was a whole debate over it. I remember the debate, but it was like February 1st or February 14th. It was one of those. No, March. I'm completely wrong. March. Uh, like, March 6th. But, March yeah, 6th. because they, they couldn't prove, like, nobody actually knows when Michelangelo's birthday is. Really? Like, no, they, they're ancient renaissance They didn't people. have computers back then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can screw it up with computers just as fast as you can with This is paper, true. To be honest. This is true. All right, I'll skip around uh, as well. Um, a computer worm written by Dutch programmer named Jan de Witt on February 11, 2001, designed to trick email users into opening an uh, email message purportedly containing a picture of a famous tennis player whose name is... Uh, this is going to be the only one to get right. It's going to be embarrassing, but Anna Kornikova. Yes, Anna Kornikova. <laughs> you Very nice. I, well, no, but I, you know, I did work at a company where uh, I, I was in the field, I was doing work, and all of a sudden I, I got a, me a message alert on my phone. And it was an old Blackberry, you know, so it wasn't even email. It was like their little pseudo message, whatever. Uh, and then I got another one. And they got another one, and I was kind of ignoring oh, it. Yeah, overwhelmed mail servers. Yeah. Yes. And the flood started coming in. I was in Atlanta. I had to rent a car and drive back because I couldn't catch a flight in time to get in and start cleaning up the mail servers and, and recover that. So I, I remember that one very clearly. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, here's one I remember very clearly. In 2001, a worm spread by exploiting holes in both Sun Solaris and Microsoft IIS. To compromise Sun Solaris, the worm takes advantage of a two-year-old buffer overflow in which program and or service on Solaris? Uh, that I don't know. And it, uh, okay. Wow, now you're really good. <laughs> <That's Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so was it uh, in it? D, was it uh, NTPD, was it 
SSHD, thank you, or was it S Admin D? Uh, you know, I'll go with S Admin D. You it was the S Admin D worm. <laughs> there was a buffer overflow, and coincidentally, it was my first incident response when I worked for a university. My first week, ah, actually. Very cool. Yes. Back when uh, rocks were soft and dirt was young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back when Sun Microsystems had a future. Oh, <laughs> no, not even that far back. <laughs> All right, the Code Red Worm. Uh, Why did they call it Code Red? What? Oh, you, you. This is so stupid. This is so stupid. What? This is like the, the, the precursor of all the stupid malware names out there. <laughs> uh, because they all watched the, uh, what was it, uh, the movie with, uh, hell, Tom Cruise and... No. Yeah. That's Mission Impossible. No, nah, what was the one when they were in Cuba? And... Doesn't even know yeah. the movie. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know the movie name. Is, it, is that right, though? Is from that movie? With nope. The... Absolutely no. wrong. Right. It let me is. Let something to drink. <laughs> Hang on. Let me drink something. I wish we had some Mountain Dew. They named it after that stupid Mountain Dew? <laughs> <laughs> they were drinking Mountain Dew, and so they named it after the damn stuff they were drinking. I have never heard that. If I named a malware, I would name it after something... <laughs> I don't know. Like Did a... you practice this? No! <laughs> but was I dramatic I... enough? Let me get something to drink! <laughs> oh my god, I can't. I think I just peed a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> All right, here's an easy one. The Nimda worm was discovered and spread through a variety of means, including vulnerabilities in Microsoft Windows and backdoors left by Code Red and SAdmin D. Where does the name come from? Apparently, I know nothing about malware. I have no idea how Nimda got It was called it. Nimda. Nimda. Backwards and forwards. Look at Nimda. Uh, Nimda all right, so it's sick. admin spelled backwards. Yes, uh, very good. Uh, do you remember the IIS vulnerability that Code Red exploited? What was the extension called in IIS? Uh, shoot, was that, it wasn't AS, was it ASP? It wasn't. No. Uh. No. I, I'm only going to get Anna Kornikova right. That's how I'm going to remember. Uh, I'll go with CGI. <laughs> it was ISAPI. Oh, an ISAPI plugin. The ISAPI yeah. extension. Yes. Uh, the, the, the other one, that one's kind of bogus. Uh, that's all I had, really. <laughs> unless the questions. What questions? Oh, more questions? No, the, fu the, the, the fu future questions. Oh, oh, if we have time, you want to do the future of security? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the major changes you hope to see in security over the next five years? Uh, that I hope, because so, um, personally, I think that uh, it's really frustrating right now that we buy products and we implement them in our production environments and we it's kind of left up to us to make sure that they're secure. And in other industries, you don't have that, nice. right? In other industries, like in electronics, you have underwriter laboratories where when I buy a hoverboard, if it's UL rated, I know it's not gonna catch on fire and explode. And so in the next five years, well, you well, you well, well, now those weren't you all rated. Oh, they weren't? No, they weren't. Th that was why they, they started blocking them in customs. That's why they were pulling oh, them back. Like they were God. not tested and rated. Absolutely not. So how did they get in the country? Mail. <laughs> so I, I would love to start seeing software and hardware go through some kind of testing procedure like that. And I would love to see that happen prior to the government getting involved. Right, because once the government gets involved, it becomes a huge mess. There are efforts for, uh, along those lines uh, uh, already. Peter correct? Zacco, right? yeah, yeah, much is working on that. Yeah, I don't know how far he got. I haven't heard from him. Mm -hmm. He said he was getting there. Mm. I talked to him six months ago. So let's see, Peter, if you're watching this, let us know. Yeah, I know Spyrant and a few other organizations are working to do the same thing. Yep. I don't know which one's going to win, but I really hope we can keep it private sector because that's where the action happens. Uh, UL did it for a long time. They were they were nonprofit. Now they're for profit, but it it worked there. It seems like it would work in our industry too. Um, how will the threats evolve in computer security over the next several years? I think we're going to see more monetization, right? So ransomware oh. has really been successful because it can be monetized, yeah, right? Easily monetized. Easily monetized. That's the kicker. Yeah. And, and all the other ones that we talked about, things like Nimda and stuff like that, you know, they weren't monetized. That was just, hey, let's, let's wreak a bunch of havoc and get a little notoriety out of it. But when you can monetize these things, if, if people can do APTs and other things actually have a, a good monetization channel, mm -hmm. that's when it's going to really blow up. And so I think we're going to see more and more threats that center around that, not just hacking for the sake of hacking, but hacking for, for making money. Uh, 
all of us here and Donna have had several conversations about that we love technology we use technology Donna like oh we just bought the same exact laptop <laughs> like it's the latest model from system 76 <laughs> it's awesome yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but as we adopt technology and use technology how will security be applied as it becomes more and more part of our now I mean it is part of our everyday lives that's going to trickle down into people that aren't as big a nerds as us three if that's even possible yeah I <laughs> I think that we we are starting to see hardware not advance as fast as it used to. You know, like it, it used to be, I, I want a new laptop every year because new stuff came out. Now, you can go three years, five years sometimes, and laptops haven't really changed all that much. So we're seeing people keep their stuff a lot longer, and we're seeing the real changes happen in software. And on the software side, we're seeing so many features roll out that are causing security problems, that are causing weaknesses, that I, I hope that we'll start to see changes on that side. And I think people are becoming more accepting of the fact, like, I don't need to be an administrator on my own machine. I can have that secondary account. I can have, you know, some way that, that prevents these types of compromises that in the past you, you didn't see, where people would, would do a blank password or an auto login. And I think we're seeing more awareness, and, and people are starting to, to correct that. But not, not from your look. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was just the, the blank password made me cringe. Uh, what about the no password? That really made you cringe. Oh, dude. I, uh. Uh, but it's an interesting point about it, and it feeds back to things are evolving. The monetization of, of malware, the monetization of crime, uh, versus now we've got people. Uh, Mac, for example, Apple made it mandatory with uh, El Capitan that you didn't have root on everything in your machine. Mm -hmm. So the, we're seeing that kind of thing happen in sort of real time, and it's fascinating. But they still have a check mark for automatic logon when you turn your computer on. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it, it it's kind of. Half-assed, I think, is the best way to put it. Like, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta take a stand and say, "This is how we're gonna, we're gonna secure things." But it's still. But I valid. still think uh, a lot of those security mechanisms we have to sacrifice usability. And when I think about the devices in the future and how we'll use them, we should have security without sacrificing usability. I feel like that's an achievable goal in my utopian world about yeah. twenty years from now. Normally, I'd say it would be a nightmare to do that. Like taking features away from people is really hard to do. But if you look at the way people use mobile devices today, where you've taken away a huge amount of functionality and people accept it. You've got a lot of people that just have an iPhone and an iPad. And they don't even bat an eye at the, about the fact that they can't oh, that's install their own custom software. Yeah, like, I never thought just, of it that way. That's very so, interesting. So they've been moved into a walled garden mm -hmm. and they accept it. Because an app-based app walled garden where you have extremely single-purpose, single-focus apps. Mm -hmm. And if you need another focus, if you need another purpose, another function, you just get that app. But it is very, very stripped down, very locked down, very, very complete for just exactly that piece. That's a fascinating perspective. I like that. Yeah, the non-technical users are, are not having a problem doing that, saying, you know, I'm just going to go to a tablet. I don't need a laptop anymore. I'll just mm. use this tablet. And meanwhile, you've just taken so much functionality away from them, and they're okay with it. And they're paying more. Those tablets are expensive. Right? And they're not jailbreaking anymore either because there's no reason to. Well, what extra functionality do you get now that when you jailbreak. I think I mean, other than changing carriers. That's part of it. Most carriers it, support the iPhone now. But going back to monetization, like let's say the three of us discovered a jailbreak method right now, right? W would you just post it on the internet and give it away when you could sell it to the US government for a million dollars? Right? So I think that Good anybody point. who's finding these, like the, the Pangus and the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever other people are discovering the jailbreaks, they're just turning around and selling it to a government, mm. uh, you know, so it doesn't get announced. Not but, necessarily our government but either. But you're right, yeah, you're you know, uh, um, uh, you know, like I, I use an Android phone and I used to always root my Android phone. Now I don't. And no I don't because there's no need and the security risk is too great. Yes, 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 yes. yes. If you root a phone uh, of any kind, especially Android, the security just drops off like a floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's amazing how bad it can get. I had somebody that rooted a phone, uh, I guess, four or five months ago. And for some reason, like some GPS program they needed, that they needed to side load and do all sorts of weird stuff to the operating system. And that phone got destroyed uh, when it got connected to the internet within, I think, two hours. Yeah. It was unbelievable the scans that are happening on an ongoing basis. Find a jailbroken phone, I own that sucker. The most popular SU binary for Android is closed source. We don't know what's in it, right? Hmm. And, and that, that's what you get when you root. So I think that moving people into a more restricted environment is already happening. Yeah. And, and people are accepting of it. So if this were 10 years ago, people would not stand for that. But now, uh, I guess we can... Thank Steve Jobs, <laughs> you know, for, for stealing people's functionality and not letting or making them think it's okay. It's, I, I, That's awesome. <laughs> Don, thank you so much. Thank you.